Terraria has many NPCs that employ a variety of melee, ranged, and magic attacks to defend themselves from enemies. NPCs grow in power during your journey, but what if we did something crazy and try to make them completely unstoppable? How's it going, crew? This is Happy Days, and today we're going to see how overpowered you can make the NPCs in Terraria. We've done a few of these OP videos now, so I'll display all the usual rules on screen. We will be attempting to defeat all progress events and bosses using only NPCs. I am allowed to defend myself from basic mobs like slimes and bats, while out exploring the world. With all that said, let's get this crazy challenge started. We begin our adventure with a fresh new forest to destroy to collect tons of wood. There's lots of NPCs available early on, so I'm excited to get out exploring so we can find them. In fact, we can get a new NPC right now by throwing our copper short sword at a slime to transform it into the squire slime. After crafting the usual wooden equipment to protect myself, I get started on some basic NPC housing. I'll take the time to make a few extra houses to ensure I can grab every NPC as soon as they're available to keep them safe in our base. After slaughtering some more slimes for torches, I head underground to start looting. In Terraria, each NPC has specific spawning requirements that must be fulfilled before they will join our town. To get our first few NPCs, we'll need 50 silver for the merchant, some explosives for the demolitionist, and a firearm for the arms dealer. Most NPCs start with 250 HP, 15 defense, and 10 attack. They can power up during the game from major events such as defeating bosses, starting hard mode, and through the use of several items. If you're wondering, I'm playing on a small world in normal mode with a journey mode character. We'll be using some journey mode options to showcase the power of our NPCs and we'll see it in action soon enough. I stumble into a spider's cave so I decide to take the opportunity to recruit the stylus by placing some platforms and ropes in the area and using throwing knives to keep the spiders at bay. Eventually the stylus spawns and I quickly rescue her as we add one more NPC to our army. Back at base we say hi to all our new NPCs before visiting the merchant who I purchased some rope, piggy banks, an anvil and a bug net from. I then craft a topaz gem hook, a platinum pick, as well as an enchanted boomerang. Back to exploring, I find an underground desert, and even though it's quite dangerous, the extra loot is nice, and it gives me an opportunity to find the golfer NPC. Some NPCs, such as the party girl, require at least eight NPCs before they have a chance to move in, so it's worthwhile meeting this criteria as early as I can. Soon enough, we find the golfer practicing his swing on top of a boulder, because of course he is, oblivious to the extreme danger all around him before inviting him to join our growing army of NPCs. Next, I set out for the ocean to find the angler NPC, which also gives me a chance to pass through several biomes and work on progress towards the zoologist NPC. The zoologist requires us to fill out 10% of the beast collecting thingy, and yes, I totally can't pronounce that word, including critters, mobs, and NPCs. Arriving at the ocean, I find the angler floating gently on the waves, so I wake him up and he takes a bath before I jump in myself to look for more loot. I swing past the corruption to smash a few shadow orbs for a guaranteed musket, as we still don't have the arms dealer NPC, and this will ensure he comes for a visit. We're almost ready for our first big NPC battle, but there's still a few more things to do first. After drinking a gravitation potion, I buy a cat license from the zoologist before launching myself into space. The clumsy balloon slime is a rare mob that spawns in the space layer, and after realizing I need to break its balloon, we plummet to the ground as I score NPC number 14. Next, I craft some sonar potions before making a reinforced fishing pole and some enchanted night crawlers. After making a bed, I head to a nearby lake as we're about to achieve two goals at the same time. We now have the required amount of NPCs for the party girl to spawn, and we've also met the criteria for a blood moon to occur and using a bed is a great way to wait for both to happen. The next morning the party girl arrives and that night a blood moon begins. Our mission is to fish up the advanced combat techniques which gives all our NPCs 6 extra defense and 20% more damage. Soon enough our Sona potion says the book is on our line and then the line breaks because of course it does! No! A few nights later another blood moon spawns and I finally get my prize. It's time for our first major battle and I need to prepare a basic arena for all of our NPCs. My main goal is to keep all our NPCs close together so the nurse can keep them all healed up, so I'll be using a variation of the volcano trap. This next part will be easier once I have the mechanic and steampunker NPCs, but for now I need to relocate our NPCs to the arena manually using houses. NPCs will instantly teleport to their new homes during the night time when the player is off screen, so by making the only available housing in our arena, I can move my NPCs there and they won't try and move away. I spend a few days tweaking the arena and eventually the goblins invade and it's time to put our NPC army to its first big test. During a and boss fights in this challenge, I'll be using God Mode on my character for three main reasons, which are observation, positioning, and arena setup. I'll put some extra info on screen now, but basically using God Mode allows me to observe how our NPCs interact with each boss and event and place them in the best position to maximize their damage. Our nurse is a real MVP, keeping everyone healed up with the party girl and demolitionist dealing a ton of damage with their grenades, and soon enough, the goblins are defeated using only NPCs. With the goblins defeated, I begin to dig a elevator as it's time to unlock our next 
next NPC, the Goblin Tinkerer. Each new NPC we can acquire gives our team more damage potential, so I'll be grabbing everyone who's available at each stage of the game. A bit of exploring and a few life crystals later, we soon find the poor bound goblin, so I quickly free him and buy some rocket boots and a Tinkerer's Workshop. I head back out and keep exploring, and I hit incredible luck as I find a Queen statue. The Queen and King statues can teleport female and male NPCs respectively to their location, and as you can imagine, will be incredibly useful in this challenge. The town dog is available once we complete 25% of the beast listing page thingo, which will just require me to visit a few biomes I haven't fully explored yet. This will give me a chance to max out my HP as well as get more loot and upgrade my accessories even more. Just as I'm about to finish spelunking, I find a king statue. I happily lock it in place next to the queen statue, ready to use soon in our challenge. Back at base, I craft a pair of frost spark boots and then buy a dog license from the zoologist for our next NPC. I then max out my mana and craft a set of platinum armor and a platinum bow and axe to go with it. All that's left is to sleep in my bed until a party starts. The cool slime NPC spawns when a natural party begins and we can also grab a slice of cake from the party girl for a nice mining speed boost. As always, the first stage has a lot to do in terms of things to unlock and power-ups available, but here's what I achieved in pre-hard mode without fighting a single boss. We've unlocked tons of NPCs including all pre-boss town NPCs such as the party girl, goblin tinkerer and golfer, lots of the town slimes and the cat and dog town pets. I fished up the advanced combat tactics to give our NPCs a 20% increase to their damage and plus ticks to their defense, bringing their total to 21. I'm sure this may come up in the comments, but from my testing it doesn't appear that things like heart lanterns, honey and campfires buff friendly NPCs unfortunately. Also, you may have noticed that I'm not maxing out my own character and that's because this challenge is all about our NPCs. I'll be doing some updated OP class videos very soon though, so stay tuned. I'd also like to give a quick honorable mention to the Rabbit Town Pet, as I have to be honest, I'm not sure if I can achieve 45% of the beast listing collection page thing without fighting any bosses or having access to the dungeon, but I'm sure someone out there can answer that for me in the comments below. It's time to start stage two and that means we have access to everything up to the wall of flesh battle. Earlier I mentioned that where I position our NPCs for battles is really important as each boss has very different attack patterns, so I'll likely do a test run of each boss to observe how they move beforehand. After setting up our arena and moving our NPCs using the trick I showed you earlier, we begin our first NPC boss challenge. As I don't have access to things like wiring and teleporters yet, my strategy is just to force the NPCs to stand as close as possible to the boss to maximize their damage. Due to their passive AI, our NPCs occasionally get stuck in a runaway loop and stop attacking, but if I move a little, I can get the boss to bump them back into action. Soon enough, the eye goes down and we get our first NPC boss power boost of 3 defense and another 10% to their damage. Before we fight any more bosses, there's a few more NPCs we can get our hands on and I start by swinging past the corruption to make a slime crown. I drop by base as the Dryad has spawned. Now we've defeated the Eye of Cthulhu and I buy some purification powder from her as we're going critter hunting. I move all my NPCs to the jungle to block enemy spawns and then use purification powder on the mystic frog critter to turn it into the mystic slime NPC. While we're here, I use our slime crown as defeating the king slime unlocks yet another NPC. The Dryad is an extremely powerful NPC due to her Dryad's Blessing buff, which gives our NPCs 3 HP regen per second, 6 extra defense, and a 33% Thorns Aura. This is why I've been collecting all the pets, as the Dryad's Aura turns our pets, which normally can't attack anything, into little sources of bonus damage when a boss runs into them. Soon enough, the King Slime is defeated, and we get the Nerdy Slime NPC for our troubles. Our next target is the Eater of Worlds, and this will be tricky, as NPCs won't move into houses in corrupted areas, but I think I have a way around it. I start by making a basic arena on the surface of the corruption and then build a rope ladder up into space just outside of the corruption biome boundaries. As NPCs don't take full damage, I can spawn NPCs into houses floating in the air and then drop them down into the arena below. With our arena ready for action, I throw a sticky bomb at the shadow orb and then quickly get back to the surface. The Dryad's Aura is quite powerful against this boss as each segment takes damage over time while in range of the aura as well as activating the thorns debuff when hitting NPCs. I also take advantage of the Eater's preference to climb along platforms when splitting by filling our arena with them and soon enough the boss falls and our NPCs get another power boost. With the Eater defeated, we've enabled the Unconscious Man to spawn in our world. I wake him up and the Tavern Keep NPC joins our team. The boss rush continues as we prepare for our Queen Bee battle by blowing our way into a hive in the jungle. Before I bring our NPCs in, I do a quick test run of the boss to observe its attack patterns as the bee can be quite deadly and it will help to see where it likes to move around to first. With our NPCs in place, I use an Abomination and begin the battle. All the stat boosts are starting to pay off as our NPCs wail on the Queen Bee as I sit back and watch the carnage unfold. The battle goes surprisingly well and our NPCs easily take down the bee so I decide to smash the lava and farm a second one for even more loot. There's no slowing down as we head straight to the dungeon to prepare an arena to 
take on Skeletron. I decide to do a quick test run of the boss to see where the head and hands hover above my character as this will help with placing our NPCs for optimum damage output. With the arena set and our NPCs ready for battle, I summon the flying bag of bones and get the fight underway. Now our NPCs are a bit tankier, I put them in really close so I can squeeze some more damage out of the Dryad's Thorns aura. Some of them get a little low during the fight, but eventually the skull explodes and we've unlocked the dungeon. As well as unlocking the Clothier NPC for defeating Skeletron, being able to explore the dungeon will also give me access to the mechanic NPC and finally allow me to start using our King and Queen statues to easily move our NPCs all around the world. It's also a great opportunity to grab some nice loot and a few upgrades for my own character as well. Back at base I upgrade to a Nightmare Pickaxe so I can mine up some Hellstone ore before grabbing a bunch of buff potions as we're about to raid the underworld. Using our Shadow Key I get some nice upgrades as we make our way to the edge of the world. I'll need to do a bit of reforging before hard mode begins so the extra items to sell will sure come in handy. As well as a Hellforge I'll grab a little bit of Hellstone ore along the way. I don't need too much, just enough for an upgraded pick and maybe a new set of armor. I also use a bunch of sticky exploding thingies to clear out a ton of ash blocks near the edge of the world. This helps by firstly clearing out an area for me to prepare an arena on and secondly by giving me plenty of blocks to build it with. After setting up a spawn point I get started building a pathway for our wall of flesh arena. Slow moving NPCs versus a fast wall of flesh is going to be a challenge but I've got an idea that I think will work and the mechanic will make it all possible. On my way back to base I find an old shaking chest that can spawn now Skeletron is defeated. I use a golden key on it and we add the Elder Slime NPC to our team. I craft a bunch of Hellstone bars and make the Molten Pickaxe, a set of Molten Armor, the Phoenix Blaster, Imp Staff, Obsidian Skull and a Meteor Ham Axe. After crafting the Obsidian Shield I glare at the Goblin Tinkerer and hope he gives me some decent modifiers for my new equipment. There was plenty to do in this boss fighting stage and we got a massive upgrade with the Dryad NPC. We also got a bunch of new NPCs bringing our total up to 27. Most bosses we defeat will be giving our NPCs a power boost and in this stage we got a plus extra 12 defense and a whopping 40% extra bonus to our attack. In case you're wondering it appears certain optional bosses such as the Deerclops don't give any stat boost to our NPCs for defeating them so they won't be covered in this challenge. It's time for stage 3 and we begin by using our King and Queen statues to teleport our NPCs to our wall of flesh arena. Then using wires, switches, actuators and hammered blocks I'll be using a Hoik system to help the NPCs keep up with the fast moving wall of flesh. With the arena all set up I hurl the voodoo doll into the lava and release the NPCs as the battle begins. I've divided the arena into sections and anytime I flick one of the switches it will instantly push all the NPCs to the next zone. The battle gets absolutely crazy towards the end and we start losing NPCs left and right but eventually the wall explodes and we've successfully started hard mode and our NPCs get a whopping plus 12 defense bonus and an extra 40% damage boost. We even get our first hard mode NPC as the tortured soul spawns immediately so I buy some purification powder from the dryad and use it on him to transform him into the tax collector. With hard mode underway it's time to start powering up and getting even more NPCs. I start by throwing some block destroying objects around a mushroom biome to collect a heap of mud, glowing mushrooms and mushroom grass seeds as we're going to make an artificial mushroom biome on the surface. I head to space and convert a floating island into a VIP home for the truffle NPC. It doesn't take long to make a truffle approved space house but it's time to keep moving as our next NPC will unlock a much needed power boost. I set out in search for the bound wizard who appears in the cavern layer once hard mode begins. I managed to rescue him after fighting off a horde of monsters guarding him and buy a crystal ball and spell tome from him. After disabling one of those evil trap chests I discover the ether biome which I promptly throw our new spell tome into the shimmer which transmutes it into the advanced combat tactics volume 2. When used this item will give our NPCs another 6 defense and 20% bonus extra damage. Our next mission is to take on the pirate army as defeating it unlocks the pirate NPC. Thankfully the pirates are fairly easy to control with the usual volcano trap in which enemies can walk up and into but can't jump back out of. I do have to be careful of the pirate captain and the pirate's curse at spawns which get a bit of damage in but thankfully our dryad and nurse managed to heal everyone through it. Soon enough the pirates are defeated and we're off to get another NPC. With hard mode enemies available it's much easier to fill the 45% required of the long listing of beast entries to unlock the town bunny. After a small world tour I visit the zoologist and purchase the bunny license and then grab a few reforges from the goblin. This stage earned us a ton of power ups and new NPCs including the wizard, truffle, pirate and tax collector putting our total up to 32 NPCs. We also got the advanced combat tactics volume 2 which when added to the bonus for starting hard mode gives us another 18 defense and 60% extra damage. I'd also like to give an honorable mention to the Santa NPC. This NPC is available during the Christmas season by changing the date on your device to Christmas or for a single day after defeating wave 15 of the frost moon. Stage 4 begins and now we can destroy some bosses but first I need to do a quick bit of fishing to grab some crates. I'll need a hard mode anvil to craft the mech boss summons and crates 
crates are a quick way to unlock the materials to make one. With the fishing complete, I start by using some dynamite to remodel our fishing spot into a mech boss arena. The mech bosses are infamous for being NPC killers, but I think I've got just a setup to keep them nice and safe. With the arena complete, I open all my crates and then craft a mithril anvil and all three mech boss summons plus a pair of angel wings for a boost to our mobility. After getting all my NPCs in place, I summon the destroyer that night and the battle begins. I notice the dryad's healing can get interrupted by knockback from enemies, so I position her above everyone else to maximize her healing output. It takes us most of the night, but our NPCs manage to take out the destroyer with seconds to spare. As the twins tend to hover in the same space a lot, I can help my NPCs survive by moving around the outside of the arena to get them in and out of combat as needed. I open up our arena a little for Skeletron Prime so my NPCs can deal with the random flailing arms and use some conveyor belts from the Steampunker to push our NPCs back into combat range. With all the arms beginning to fall, I then bring back the Hoik trick for the second phase of the battle to concentrate their attacks on the main head in close quarters combat. Soon enough, the giant skull falls and the mech bosses are defeated and our NPCs get another 18 defense and 45% extra attack power. The next day, I swing past base and craft a hallowed pick and some random pieces of armor for some upgrades before rushing off for our next boss battle. With our NPCs powered up from defeating the mech bosses, I unleash the Queen Slime in the hallowed desert using a simple conveyor arena. Our NPCs make short work of the summoned slimes and it's not long before the Queen falls for another bonus 6 defense and 15% attack and we get some sparkle shine balloons which means it's time for our next NPC. Returning to the shimmer, I throw a sparkle shine balloon into the waves and out pops the diva slime bringing our NPC total to 34. Plantero is our next target and after finding a bulb in the underground jungle I start preparing an arena nearby for our NPCs to do battle in. With everyone in place I smash the bulb and the battle begins. Thankfully, like a lot of bosses, Plantero tends to just hover over the player so I can use a similar arena to the ones I've used earlier. Our NPCs get quite low during the battle and we do lose one of our slimes but we manage to defeat Plantero's tentacles and the boss falls soon after earning us another power boost and the temple key. Before we head to the temple however there's still another boss we need to fight. After clearing out a meteor crash site I go hunting in the hello for prismatic lace wings. Prismatic lace wings spawn in the hello before midnight and when destroyed will summon the empress of light boss. With the cyborg and princess moved in we now have all 36 NPCs and are ready for the empress of light battle. I thought this battle was going to be impossible due to her erratic movements and attacks that phase through blocks but I notice she seems to return to the same position above the player after each cycle. That said, her second phase starts to deal some serious damage to our NPCs but as long as I lure her away from them occasionally, they have time to heal up and stay in the battle a little longer. Eventually, the crazy boss falls and we grab the kaleidoscope for our troubles and as a bonus, we didn't lose a single NPC during the fight. I head back to base and all that's left is to grab a few modifiers on our equipment before we move on to the last stage of our challenge. With all of those boss fights, our NPCs got plenty of upgrades in this stage with another 38 defense and a whopping 90% extra attack power. We also got the final few NPCs including the Cyborg, Steampunker, Diva Slime and the Princess. Similar to the Deerclops earlier, it seems Duke Fishrun doesn't provide any stat boost to our NPCs so I'll be skipping over this battle but feel free to try it out if you're playing along at home. I can't believe it but we've made it to the final stage and now everything in the game is available to us to see how far our overpowered NPCs can go. I start by cracking open the temple and smashing my way through to the Golem Chamber grabbing a few lizard power cells along the way. Arriving in the chamber, I start to disarm the traps by removing all the pressure plates as I begin to prepare an arena for our NPCs to do battle in. Although I can't add my own wiring as Golem hasn't been defeated yet, I still can use the existing wiring in the chamber and some conveyor belts to get our NPCs in position for Golem. With everything set up, I summon Golem and the battle begins. I start by letting our NPCs work on the Golem Fist by standing on a platform so they can easily attack them. I then drop down so they can attack the head before moving back to the original platform so they can finish off the body. Finally, the golem falls and we get another 8 defense and 15% attack before heading off to the dungeon. You know the setup by now and with our NPCs in place, I give the cultists a taste of our new possessed hatchet as the lunatic cultist joins the battle. Thankfully, the cultist hovers in the same location above the player, meaning I can sit our NPCs right next to it to keep the damage piling on. As the cultist tends to spawn in a random position during its decoy phase, I just let the copies spawn and hope for the best. The fight gets quite chaotic towards the end with the ancient vision dealing some big damage but we take out the cultist and the stardust pillar spawns right next to us because of course it does. That said, this is an excellent chance to test out the pillars without having to move my NPCs much and at least they seem to be able to defeat some of the stardust mobs to lower the pillar's shield. My strategy here is to use conveyor belts to move our NPCs into range of the pillar and although my NPCs won't attack the pillar directly, they will attack enemies nearby which will damage the pillar in the process. This is really messy and I lose a few NPCs in the process but eventually I get everything in position and the pillar 
pillar falls as the moon lord gets ever closer for the next pillars i rush in and make a mini arena under the pillar for our king and queen statues and then using an ice rod a little area above the pillar for the mobs to attack me once i've got everything in place i fall back to give the statues time to teleport our npcs in without them being attacked by all the mobs i decide not to worry about our town pets for the pillars as unfortunately the king and queen statues don't teleport them in and we have enough townspeople now to keep everything under control it is pretty tricky setting up a mini arena while under attack but using teleporters platforms and some rope i managed to keep our npcs fairly safe and this is definitely something i'd like to make more efficient in the future with only the vortex pillar remaining i set up a spawn point near our future moon lord arena if we're going to have any hope of defeating the moon lord using only npcs i'll have to observe its attack patterns and eye position so i can place our npcs accordingly with our basic moon lord arena ready for testing i head to the vortex pillar and get set up our npcs churn through the vortex mobs and soon enough the pillar explodes as we grab the fragments and teleport back to our spawn point i even find the traveling merchant has come to watch the show so i buy a few items from him before the moon lord spawns in my goal here is to roughly mark where the moon lord's eyes and core hover so i can set up areas for our npcs to stand while the battle is on and hopefully keep them from being quickly destroyed after moving some npcs in place i test it out again similar to the pillars the npcs don't seem to want to attack the moon lord's eyes directly thankfully i think i have a solution for this back at base i swing past my statue chest and see what mob statues i have if we're going to deal with the moon lord i'm going to have to give our npcs something to swing their weapons at we begin the battle by placing the chest statue at the top of our arena with our npcs my plan is to have our npc army take out each eye one at a time after doing some testing i found the chest statue was the best to use as our op npcs took out the weaker mobs too quickly which meant less damage to the moon lord as the forward eye falls i teleport our npcs over to the next mini arena and then move the chest statue over to them after the statue is on we repeat the process taking down the hand eyes i'll put an image on screen to show the wiring i've got all the wiring leading to the central area where my character stands so i can easily move our npcs during the chaos of the battle i do want to acknowledge with god mode on the mood bite debuff doesn't work on me which prevents the moon lord from healing during the battle of course this can be countered using the nurse to heal the debuff which i've demonstrated in my thrower class only video with the hand eyes defeated only the core is left the mimics get a few good hits on my npcs and i start to worry but the mvp dryad and nurse keep everyone healed up soon enough the moon lord starts exploding and we've beaten terraria using our op npcs i grab the last prism as the credits begin to roll and i realize we didn't lose a single npc against the moon lord so who are the most op npcs in terraria let's take a look at how they fared during this challenge while we pick on some early bosses we finish this challenge with all 36 npcs unlocked adding the extra eight defense and 15 percent attack from golan and the cultists we ended up with a total of 92 extra defense and a whopping 240 percent extra attack power the absolute mvps have to be the dryad and the nurse for their healing with the top spot going to the dryad the dryad's blessing aura provided us with defense a thorns effect and regen and i don't know if this challenge would have been possible without her next comes the ranged attacker npcs with the top spot going to the princess being ranged units they seem to have a larger attack radius than the melee npcs with the princess having the largest of all of them the melee npcs come in next and at times they were really useful for bosses that tend to stay in one spot but they really suffered against enemies that move around a lot and in last place had to be the town pets and slimes they don't seem to attack but can deal contact damage when the dryad's blessing is active due to their thorns aura so it was still worth having plenty of them around to stack the damage up this was really fun to see what npcs are capable of at each stage of the game a lot of you have been asking me to try some modded op so let me know what mods you'd like me to explore next i had a blast making this video and if you enjoyed it too please smash the like button and consider subscribing for more fun videos like this and here's the most important part as always you'll stay happy and i'll see you soon this is happy days signing out see ya